Hey, Frankie. Hey, Ari. I've been thinking a lot recently about what your favorite queer coded TV character was. I most definitely have one. I think Kim Possible came out when I was maybe six. I remember watching that show and being entirely glued to the TV screen because not only was the style very queer, both in the artistic style and the fashion sense, but the relationship between Kim Possible and Shigo the villain was undoubtedly queer and there's no denying it at all. I love that answer so much. I never got to watch Kim Possible, but I used to dress like her. That was like accidental self-queer coding on so many levels. For me, it was definitely Avatar The Last Airbender. Zuko's sister, Azula. I just thought she was so cool and so badass. And I just had a massive crush on her. The follow-up show, Legend of Korra, ends with a queer kiss, but Nickelodeon wouldn't let it happen. And so they have Korra and Asami almost kissing. But then they have comic books. And the comic books start right where the TV show ended. And literally the first sketch in the comic books is them holding hands and then they kiss. And I wanted to like send a little message to my child self and be like, look, you were right. <laughs> Woke up on the right side of the Hey there, everyone. My name is Eric Eubank. I'm 17 years old. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm from La Crescenta, California. And I'm Lily Muller. I'm 19 years old. My pronouns are they, she, and he, and I'm from Massachusetts. And we want to welcome you to I'm Feeling Queer Today, the podcast that amplifies the voices of queer youth. This is episode four, Queering Media. So historically, when we look towards queer representation in media, it hasn't always been the best. At the top of the episode, we heard from producers Frankie and Ari talking about their favorite queer-coded media. Hey, Lily, I had a question. What do we mean when we use the term queer-coded? Queer-coding is when a character's sexual orientation and sometimes gender is implied by significant subtext without being stated outright. Basically, they're coded as being queer rather than being queer out loud. This phenomenon has been around since the 1930s when the film industry introduced the Hayes Code. Along with depictions of nudity, suggestive dances, blasphemy, the ridicule of religion, illegal drug use, mentions of STDs, interracial relationships, childbirth, detailed crime, and swearing, the Hayes Code also prohibited any and all depictions in film that could be regarded in any way as queer. Over the years, this censorship has resulted in a major lack of queer representation in media. So where does that leave us as queer storytellers? Well, with a lack of roles available historically for LGBTQIA plus characters and plot lines, our community has realized that if we want to be represented, we have to create media ourselves. One of the earliest ways we did this was through the creation of zines. Zines have been particularly popular in feminist, punk, and queer circles that are generally anti-establishment or anti-capitalist. In this first segment, Alex and Claire explore the way that zines have been a major part of queer culture. Let's take a listen. Hi there! In case you haven't noticed, you're listening to I'm Feeling Queer Today, a podcast by and for queer youth. Something else you may have noticed is that this isn't the most conventional delivery of a podcast as a lot of people know it. Segments weave in and out, themes and tunes and voices collide, some of us have entirely different approaches or opinions, and a lot of it is pretty DIY. I don't know about you, but I love it. If anything, this feels less like a podcast and more like a sort of audio zine. Hearing me say that, you may be asking, what's a zine? Zine, derived from magazine, is a sort of self-made slash self-published, well, magazine, kind of. 
Usually, it's one person or a bunch of people's ideas written and or drawn out then stitched together into a little physical book thing. And zines can be about pretty much whatever. I have a little collection and that contains zines about queer joy, community radio, fairies, fantasy shows, and more. But did you know that zines have an especially storied history in underground and marginalized communities, including the queer community? The reason that these groups use zines is probably because they were accessible to make and distribute. You didn't have to own any fancy production tools or have access to a TV network. Really, all you needed was to put the thing together and run it through a copy machine. This means it appealed to a lot of people whose voices didn't always make it into the mainstream. So I sat down with Claire, another member of our production team, to discuss zines and their queer history. Hello Claire, how are you doing today? I'm alright, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. Welcome to my little segment about zines. So here's my first question. How would you define a zine? When I hear the word zine, the first thing that comes to mind is kind of like a scrapbook with a motive. Some sort of vehicle for information in the form of creative, cheap, free expression. I love that. I think that really expands on like the philosophy of the zine and the purpose of the zine. So that's really cool. Have you ever read a zine or been in a zine? So I'm in a uh, like a media and pop culture class right now where we're kind of exploring all different angles of media. But we just did a zine unit and we got to read a bunch of zines because we in, in my school's library, they have a zine collection. And if you make one and you submit it to the school, they'll just put it in the library no matter what it's about. And so there are zines about, you know, sexuality, um, your relationships with race and your relationships with your family and stuff like that. And there are also just zines about your favorite food. So I got to make my own zine and I kind of just took a writing piece that I had and I like cut up certain lines from it and I cut some pictures out of magazines and lines from books, stamps and stuff. And I kind of just created my own little zine like that was like five inches tall, three inches wide. And it was a really wonderful experience. And we also got to learn about Riot Girl and those kinds of zines and the zines of the past that were modes of political information. So you have read zines and you have been in zines. What do you know about the history of like queer zines? You touched on some of the politicism, but I was wondering if you know about anything about that in particular. So I actually don't. I don't know enough about zines as a whole. I know very briefly what my professor talked to me about. I didn't even know Riot Girl was a zine. I always called political magazines pamphlets and stuff like that. And they showed us some examples, but I didn't realize that those qualified as zines. And that's why I was saying it's kind of like scrapbooking because it can really be anything that you want. But I would love to learn more about queer zines and stuff like that. I think what makes something a zine, and this is kind of what I touched on earlier in the segment, is the fact that these are self-made, self-published, a lot of zines, especially back in the day, were just, you ran it through a photocopier. So they are very DIY in nature. But yeah, because of that, a lot of marginalized voices are drawn to zines because they're just so easy to make. There is a lot of queer history in zines. I've done some digging and there's a little bit of everything. There's queer art, there's queer resources, there's like tips on everything from like safe sex to gender affirming care to just, here are some cool queer movies and bands. That's so cool. That makes so much sense because you also don't need to enlist the help of a publishing company or like a company that probably has ulterior political motives or like an agenda that they're personally pushing. And then they would probably try to push onto whatever you're creating. There is an inherent do it yourself feeling to the LGBTQ community like, OK, we can't do this. You won't help us. We're just going to do it ourselves. But I feel like that is the case in a lot of marginalized communities as well. And just the idea of the zine where you just you create something, you write something down, you, you know, make what you wanted to see or what you needed to hear and you get to just photocopy it for like a couple cents a page and then ship it out. That's that's amazing to me. And I guess that's why it kind of reminded me of this podcast, because a lot of us are just recording from our bedrooms with what technology we have and we're making something pretty cool, if I do say so myself. No, I completely agree. And I think that that is my favorite part about this podcast is that every week, it's always a surprise to see what people come up with and what segment is made. And I always learn something. You're so right. It really is exactly like an auditory zine. And that is so important, I feel like. And it's such like a wonderful callback. Yeah, this whole queering the podcast thing can seem pretty new and fresh, but there's definitely a lineage that we owe a lot of this back to. 
it's like an ode to queer culture, maybe even a bit of a continuation of it. And that's really exciting to me. I completely agree. I feel like because I, I, I did a queer fashion segment and you were a part of it. I feel like we talked a lot about how a lot of the things that we do now aren't exactly like what what the community has done in the past, but it is a continuation. It is often an ode to what has happened in the past. And I think that's so it's so exciting because it feels like it feels like generational traditions in a family. I guess the really interesting thing about queer culture is that so much of the family is chosen. It's really interesting to talk about family traditions and things like that with the queer community because of the fact that, like, generally, when people connect with queer culture, that is not through their biological family. That is not something that is passed down to them as a familial tradition. But I think that that's part of why a lot of us just go to actively explore queer tradition and old queer stuff. And I have, like, three or four t-shirts based off, like, vintage queer groups and vintage queer slang and because... We don't really, like, have any other means of connecting to that kind of history besides just, like, exploring it and trying to celebrate it ourselves. Yeah, and you can connect to your own familial heritage. Sometimes it's it's more difficult in America because, you know, we're removed from where we came from. You have to seek out queer culture. And I think that that's so amazing because it creates this kind of research, this need to find this culture, heritage almost. So beautiful. There are even like entire movies kind of like based off this whole idea of just like looking for queerness in the past for something or someone to resonate with. I believe it was The Watermelon Woman that had this whole plot about this lesbian looking for more information on a woman in a film who was possibly queer. I believe it's like one of the first feature films to either star or be directed by a black lesbian. I wholly recommend it. I've been seeing clips of this all over TikTok and I've been like, what is this movie? That movie's probably like around 30 years old now. We've just always been doing this. We've always been looking back through history for either like the overt queer symbolism and overt queer art and creativity and resilience. Or we've been looking for it in the underground. And we've been looking for it where it wasn't like safe to be overtly discussed. Whenever I see older gay couples or Mm -hmm. pictures of gay couples in the past it is it brings me a sort of peace i didn't realize i was missing it, it's kind of just like oh we were here we were there we are everywhere yep. moment you know that is so important to be able to see yourself in the past when you feel like it was an impossible thing to see because personally i grew up thinking that nobody was gay like it wasn't a thing you know i thought there was genuinely something off about me it was just extremely interesting and then once i started to find people in the media or people around me that were it was like oh okay interesting turn of events i wish i knew this sooner and to see that be a part of history is so beautiful like being able to go back and say we have always been there i follow youtubers whose whole thing is here are queer people from the 1920s And being able to be a part of that history and like go out there and create stuff that has an overtly queer lens. That's just always been really exciting to me. Me too. So I guess my last real question is, can you tell me about a zine that you read lately that you really enjoyed? It's okay if it's not available online or anything. I just, I'm curious. I did just read one. It was in my school zine library. And I think it was called like Rules for Gay Men or something like that. And it was a bunch of these rules and it was subverting all of these stereotypes it was like okay have you ever read that book the american girl dolls book about how to make boys like you or something like that but it's actually just an entire book about like self-confidence and being good to yourself that is adorable i am not american i did not get the american girls this <laughs> oh <laughs> i forgot um but it was kind of just like that it's a book of rules on how to be a gay man but it's actually just like don't listen to any of these things be yourself because no matter what, you're going to be you anyway. And it was also really visually stunning. Like there were this collage of grinder notifications. It was so beautiful. Honestly, any zine that you can find and pick up, it's worth it to read it. Yeah, they're really just like a piece of like someone's very resistance. Exactly. Yeah, that's really exciting. Thank you for talking to me today, Claire. Thank you for having me. I had so much fun. Zines were a way for queer folks to share their voices, which were, and in a lot of places unfortunately still are, actively silenced. Going back through archives, you'll often find zines about queer experiences, activism, art, resources, and safety, and more. I found everything from advice on gender-affirming care to poetry, movie reviews, and collages and visual art. 
zines were pretty queer, and they still are. You'd think that the internet would stop out this practice, but if anything, it's made zines even more popular and accessible. Older zines can be found in internet archives, and with today's technology, it's easier to create and distribute zines digitally. Here are some places that you can find queer zines. Starting online, I found the Queer Zine Archive Project, the Digital Transgender Archive, and the Queer Zine Library. Additionally, any local queer bookstores or community spaces might have some zines, old or new. And if you don't find what you're looking for, you are more than free to make it yourself. Happy zining! I don't have a very formal experience with zines, but when I was little, I think like second grade, I would make printer paper, Crayola marker zines with my friends. It was just us doodling in the format of a zine, folding the printer paper into like six equal chunks. It was a great way for little me to express myself. There's like buckets of art that I did as a kid. Little bleak. I was like a Wednesday Adams as a child. I was like, another day, I woke up and the sun was out. I stared at my hand for three hours. Nothing has changed. I was very the opposite. I drew like flowers and the sun with a little smiley face in the corner and rainbows. So I was like, another day, the sun, hooray. There are two types of people. <laughs> yeah. I do just want to add to that, that I feel like there's a, a misconception and sort of an internalized belief that to be an artist, God, Obama, and the Pope have to know your name. <laughs> you have to be changing the world and everybody knows about it. But I think to be an artist, to be a creative, to be in your case, like an activist, like bringing attention to new issues, even to just change the way that you see and experience your own life is, is important. Changing your small communities, also extremely powerful. Art doesn't have to change the world. It just has to change your world, change someone's world. Yeah. So, while zines have for many years been a great way to amplify queer voices in print, what about queer visibility as depicted on screen? Well, coming up next is One Minute Trivia, hosted by Trudy Pooks. The questions are centered around queer love and how it's depicted both on and off screen throughout history. Welcome to One Minute Trivia. It's longer than one minute, but who's counting? I'm your host, Trudy Pooks. Here's how I set up the game. I've written up a bunch of different questions. Some hard, some easier. For each question you get right, you will get two points. Are you ready? Three, two, one, go. Today we are doing queer love theme trivia, and I'm here today with Sonia Mia Blanco and Samuel Smalls. My name is Sonia Mia Blanco, and my pronouns are she, her. Hi, my name is Samuel Smalls, my pronouns are he, him. And I'm your host, Trudy Pooks, and I use they, them pronouns. How are you guys doing? How's your day going? My day pretty much just started, but I'm excited to start the day. It's not pouring rain today, so that's exciting. How are you, Sam? How's your day going? My day is going pretty good. Uh, It's spring break, so the rest has been very needed. It's great. And I've been playing video games, which I really enjoy. That's very fun. My guilty pleasure is Fortnite. Are we ready to start with the first question? While reality dating shows can be fun to binge, they are almost always structured to be cis, hat, and white. Shows such as Perfect Match on Netflix have had openly bisexual contestants on their show, and in 2023, Netflix released an all-queer season of the dating show, The Ultimatum. However, it was a certain season of MTV's Are You the One that was the first American dating show to feature entirely queer contestants. This included genderqueer contestants as well, who had no limitations on dating various genders. The season was praised by many people in the LGBTQ plus community and won the GLAAD Media Award for Outstanding Reality Program. What year was this season of Are You The One released? A, 2015, B, 2019, or C, 2021? So what are we thinking off the bat? I was either going between 2019 or 2021, but I'm leaning a little more towards 2021 just because that show sounds pretty cool. And 
I just feel like that show wouldn't necessarily exist in 2015 just yet. Yeah, I'm going to lock in my answer for 2021. I was thinking 2019 only because I feel like if it was 2021, like I would have a better recollection. The eighth season of Are You the One was released June 26, 2019. There are very, very few queer reality dating shows, but I was able to find one American gay dating show called Prince Charming. However, then it had a spinoff in Germany that was the same show. It went on for four seasons and then also had a spinoff of, off of that called Princess Charming, which was a lesbian dating show. Do you guys watch reality TV? I think kind of entertaining to watch, but I do... Almost every time I watch a reality TV show, I'm like, damn, I wish there was definitely more openly queer relationships being presented on screen and obviously uh, more representation of people of color. For me, I do love competition reality TV shows like Survivor and Big Brother. I love Big Brother. I usually watch seasons that have already passed, of course. Uh, I'm looking for a cast with queer people in it because I just like just like watching people that are like me. Yeah, I do. I do like competition reality TV shows a lot. Absolutely. I mean, there's something so compelling about competition reality TV. Like you mentioned Survivor. I watched a season of that with my sister. I heard that they're doing a Survivor podcast. I feel like I'm seeing more shows kind of doing that. The Office has one. And then I think there's one going on for Wizards of Waverly Place. Wizards of Waverly Place is new information to me, and I I love that show growing up. So that's that's kind of exciting. I wonder how, what they're going to do with that. I've seen clips on TikTok. It's the woman who plays Harper and the dad. I think his name is David DeLuise. Are you guys ready to move on to the second question? It is becoming increasingly common to see openly queer people in the media. Being in a queer relationship has not always been viewed the way it is in our current westernized society. In fact, gay and queer relationships have been consistently seen in history, even if they are not necessarily widely known. When was the first gay relationship recorded? A. 2400 BCE B. 1632 or C. 1890 I'm thinking that was BCE because I do know just from life experience and reading a lot of books and watching TV and stuff that queer relationships existed in ancient Greece and they were actually normalized. I do think that that sounds right. Perfect. So 2400 BCE for you. Honestly, the first uh, caveman who existed was probably gay, you know. In 1890, that would make sense. But also, I'm going to have to probably agree. I was thinking about Greece and like, okay, wait, no, I'm going to stick with 1890 because I feel like there was definitely a lot of like homoeroticism and within folk and stories and stuff. But I don't know if it was like officially recorded until 1890. So I'm going to say C. The first gay relationship was recorded in 2400 BCE between uh, Kunumhotep and Ninkanu who were ancient Egyptian royal servants. There were depictions of them embracing, which is what led the historians to believe they were a gay couple. When I was reading about this, they kept saying things in different articles that were like, they, they filed their documents in an unusual way, or like, his wife was erased from all these things. And I was like, yeah, because they were gay. That's crazy. I don't think I would have guessed that. I just find it interesting about what you were saying about how the historians try to erase their queerness. It's like a trope I've seen a lot about how people will say, oh, they were just really close friends when it's very obvious that people are queer. It's weird to me that all the signs will be there and all of the documents and the and the pictures, but historians will beat around the bush as much as possible to negate the existence of queerness when it's, you know, when it's always existing. I completely agree with everything Sam just said. I don't know, growing up, I always felt that my grandma was like not straight at all. I one day just found a bunch of photographs at my uncle's house of my grandma when she was younger in her 20s. And she was always with the same woman all the time, like in all of these pictures for over years and years. And I just had to ask my mom because, you know, I'm already out to my mom and she's very accepting. She's super cool. I love her very much. And I, I had to ask her, do you ever think that because I call my grandma mom, I was like, do you ever think that mom was like, you know, maybe not straight? She's like, oh, yeah, 
no, I definitely, definitely think she's at least bisexual or something like that. I was like, okay, okay. I built up the courage to come out to my 90-year-old grandma. I was kind of nervous. She's like not even from America. She's from El Salvador. And I came out to her and she's like, oh, good, good. Like that was just her response and she was so happy. And then I was like, oh, okay, you're almost a little too accepting of this right now. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to ask you your sexuality because I don't, I don't know if you even know much about that. But I think deep down, we both know. So I, I completely agree with what you said, Sam, because that's, that's how I felt. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you guys have any last thoughts before we close up this one minute trivia that was longer than one minute? Why isn't there a gay Disney princess yet or yep. gay prince or gay anything? Or why isn't there more queer representation in Disney in general? That's my question. And if it doesn't, if that doesn't come out or it doesn't exist by the time I'm 23 or out of college, then I promise everyone listening to this podcast, I, Sonia Mia Blanco, will create that. Thank you. They're losing out potential to have some sort of rainbow ride at Disney World. I've been watching straight people kiss since I was six, and I don't want to kiss a woman. So I don't think that watching two men kiss or two women kiss would cause a straight child to want to kiss a man or kiss a woman, but it would cause all the little boys like me to know that how they feel on the inside is not wrong. And that and that's that's the beautiful thing about representation. And if it's not done by the time Slay Me at 23, she can call me and I'll be in the movie or the or the anime itself. How oh, kidding you up, Sam. <laughs> I'll watch all of it. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And to wrap up, I would now like to uh, do a final tally of each of your scores. And if the audience played along, let them know what these scores mean to them. Okay, Sam, you got both questions right. Congratulations. And Sonia Mia, you got one question right, which is like, or wait, I'm so sorry, I messed up. So do you mean you got no questions, right? Well, we love the variety in answers. We like having a variety of people and perspectives. So it's important, you know, just because you don't get questions right doesn't make you a loser. And that should be the tagline. I'm calling it right now. So let's look at what the score means for everyone, including the audience, if they paid along. Zero questions right. You may have come out of the closet and yet you evade Cupid's rainbow arrow. Go home, become a friend of Dorothy. It's your time. One question right. You are on your track to being a queer love expert, and yet you still haven't watched any gay German reality dating shows. And if you got two questions right, you are such an expert at queer love, your face is turned into a rainbow. Go soar in the clouds and bask in your queerness. And that is One Minute Trivia. We have Samuel Smalls. We have Sonia Mia Blanco. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm your host, Trudy Pooks. I use the pronouns. The question of all time, why is there no gay Disney princess or prince yet? I mean, just want to put it out there. I think Li Shang from Mulan was fully disappointed when he found out that Mulan was not a guy because they they were definitely flirting the whole time, the whole movie. This grinds my gears because I was very like a girly girl child. I was like, I'm going to be wearing some princess dresses with my Barbies, frolicking in the woods and putting on a fashion show. And kind of like Sam says, I watched straight people fall in love my whole childhood and all it gave me was anxiety. Um, so I don't think that having queer characters on children's TV is good. I think it will do way more help than it will do damage because I don't think it'll do any damage at all. And also, if anyone is like seeing gay representation on screen and it's making them think maybe I should do that, then they're probably not straight to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do think Disney starting to put stuff in their like young adult programs. So Andy Mac was just at the end of like my Disney era and there was a gay character in that. But last year they put out an adaptation of the movie Willow. They put a series on Disney Plus and they deplatformed it and it had um like a full like lesbian relationship and I was like, Oh, I'll watch that. That's so cute. It's in the woods and then they took it down and I said, I beg your pardon, Disney Plus. Oh, <laughs> Long story short, I do think we need representation, as always. And I'm really happy almost that we're having like other platforms step up to give us children's programming that does have more inclusive storylines. There's a few children's programs now that have non-binary kids or trans kids or like children with same gender parents or like multiple parents. 
Obviously, we still have much further to go in achieving more queer representation in media, but when it is done right, it can make such a beautiful difference in a young queer person's life. In our last segment, we will hear audio from the Future Perfect Project's original series, Queer Youth Animated. In this clip, you'll get to meet 16-year-old Hespers from Arica, Chile. By seeing themselves reflected on screen in their favorite LGBTQ movies and television shows, Hespers gains the confidence to live life in full, vivid color. My name is Hespers. My age is 16 years old. I'm currently in Arica, Chile, and my pronouns are they, them. When I was a child, I was not accepting of LGBTQ people. It was mostly because I grew up in a very religious household. Over the years, I tried to educate my parents. I've told them, you know what, it's not like they always follow you. It's not that bad of a thing. It's not bad at all, actually. They still don't understand. But then there are these really lovely kinds of people out there who will always accept you. I think visibility is being able to see yourself reflected in the mirror. And when I say mirror, I really mean a screen. That a screen where you're watching that musical about this girl who wants to take her girlfriend to prom. Or that screen where you're watching that movie and there is a queer character and you feel connected to them. Because of visibility, I feel a freedom that I didn't have before. For example, if I was like, oh, you know what, this girl is so cute. I couldn't say that. But now I can say, you know what? I think Katie Blanchett is super cute. And I think Miss Honey is the ultimate crush from queer culture. I think the best part of being queer is having a loving community. Like it doesn't matter if you've had a bad week, a bad month, or even a bad year. There's going to be a community loving you and to support you as well. Because of them, I can embrace myself for who I really am and say, you know what? I don't really care what the world says about me because I am my own person and I don't know anyone an explanation because of that. And nobody out there ever gets to define the life I'm meant to lead. With this unruly heart of mine. This made me think of, um, there's a poet, a queer poet named Andrea Gibson, and they have a uh, poem titled First Love where they... Uh, are speaking to their first love and they say, remember the first song we didn't have to change the pronouns for. Um, that's a misquote, but it's along that lines. And I think I have these realizations in my life where I'm listening to music or I'm watching a show and I'm like, it could be done better, but I can't believe that we have what we have. Um, obviously, it could always be more. We need a lot more representation for multiply marginalized people and trans people. Um, but even the difference from when I was a small person in uh, queer representation, especially in children's shows, because I think at the beginning of this segment with Hesperus, we see that they were raised in an environment where it wasn't taught to them. And I was raised in a similar environment. Um, and I sought out books because I was like, I want to be a better person and I want to understand people more. Um, so for me, it was books because those programs didn't exist yet. Now that they do, I think is fabulous for people that are living in environments that are maybe less tolerant or open-minded, or people that simply might um, have caregivers that don't know how to talk about it with them, that there's now resources for them to do that with their children. Yay. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think that listening to Hesperus' story when it comes to seeing representation on media really clearly and eloquently puts the fact that it's not just about seeing yourself, but it's about exploring what's okay, and it's seeing all of the possibilities of how you can identify and how you can express yourself in ways that feel normalized. And that's why I think that representation in media is so important because it provides that space to feel connected to a community even if you don't have that community like in your own life. When we get to see like queer joy in media, it kind of shows that there are ways to live as a queer person that are going to be accepted and going to be loved and cared for. But I think also just seeing queer media in the present as opposed to the past 
shows that not just the way it's depicted on screen, but the fact that you could be that queer writer, you could be that queer actor, you could be that queer storyboard artist. And ultimately, I think that that's so powerful. Even when it we go back prior decades, we can still see the fact that like queer people have always been there and we will continue to be there, but in a more powerful, more representative way. Well, that's a wrap on queer representation in media. Thanks for listening today. Again, we're your hosts, Eric Eubank. And Lily Muller. And you've been listening to I'm Feeling Feeling Queer Queer Today. today. Be sure to join us next week when Sonia, Mia, and I explore the topic of mental health. And if you like what you hear, please rate us and share the show with your friends or family or both. And don't forget to ask yourself, how am I feeling queer today? For more information and resources about this episode, check out the show notes or visit the episode page at thefutureperfectproject.org slash podcast. If you are a young person you know between the ages of 13 to 24 is currently in crisis, check out thetrevorproject.org for LGBTQIA plus specific support through text and chat or call 1-866-488-7386. We will also be including these in the description as resources. To learn more about the Future Perfect Project and all of our free arts programming for LGBTQIA plus youth, visit thefutureperfectproject.org or find us on social media at The Future Perfect Project. I'm Feeling Queer Today is produced by The Future Perfect Project in partnership with Radio Kingston WKNY AM 1490 FM 1079 Kingston, New York. This episode was produced by me, Eric Eubank, and by me, Lily Muller, Trudy Pooks, and Alex Massey, featuring Claire Florence, Samuel Smalls Jr., Sonia Mia Blanco, and Hesper. Our theme song was composed and performed by Alex Massey and produced by Emma Jane Sislowski. Additional music composed by Alex Massey, Frankie Gunn, and Epidemic Sound. Episode mixing and mastering by Julie Novak, with assistance from Emma Jane Soslowski. Special thanks to executive producers and mentors Julie Novak and Celeste Lassine, as well as Future Perfect Project team members Ryan Amador, John Juan, and Aliyah Jamil. 